part series on the life of David and the battles that he fights. And uh, we're this morning coming to Waiting in the Wilderness, David and Saul. Hope you can see that okay. If you didn't, uh, if you've not yet listened or watched last week, so I really encourage you to because each of these builds on the other. Last week, we talked about victory in the valley and we looked at the very familiar uh, event from the life of David when he faced Goliath in the valley and God gave him the victory. And we talked about uh, how we understand what the battle is. We talked about understanding ourselves and understanding who our champion is. And I hope the truths that we looked at last week have made and are continuing to make a difference in your life. When God brings truth into our lives, when we hear truth and take it in, it is never, it is never just to have it up here. I know so much. It is always that truth might transform our lives, might change us, might do things, might equip us for the battles that each one of us faces as we walk with the Lord until he takes us to heaven. Um, the time will come one day when uh, it's written in the New Testament that we will know even as we're known. We'll, we'll know all of these things. And then we will have before us, before our eyes always, the living word, Jesus himself, the expression, the full expression of God. Until then, we continue to study the word of God and bring the word into our hearts and our lives and mix it with faith and obedience and God transforms our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 So this morning, waiting in the wilderness, David and Saul. And maybe we're going to see that this new enemy, if you will, or this new battle is actually a bigger battle, a more fierce enemy than Goliath was. So we're going to look at this in the life of David. If you have your Bibles or you have your phones, click to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Last week, we jumped right into chapter 17. Chapter 17 basically is the story of David and Goliath. So we're going to back up a little bit this morning as we look at David and Saul waiting in the wilderness. As we look at 16, uh, I'm going to put some verses on here. I'm not going to read everything this morning. Please don't be overwhelmed if you see a whole bunch of uh, uh, scriptures up here. It's just to give you a little bit of background, and we're not going to read them all. But let's look at chapter 16. And in 1 Samuel 16... Uh, we see okay here we go first Samuel 16 we see that uh, God is talking to Samuel why does God talk to Samuel God talks to Samuel because Samuel is the prophet Samuel is the one that God has anointed and appointed to communicate with his people and I want to encourage you this morning because when we look at the Old Testament and how God uh, works with his people and communicates with his people, at that time and in those days, God had a chosen individual. God had a person, a prophet or, or a priest that would represent uh, uh, God to man and man to God. And God still uses people at times, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and others to communicate but how wonderful that you and I today have the Holy Spirit living in us. You don't have to go to a person to find out what God is saying to you, to find out what God uh, wants to communicate. You talk with God and God talks with you. Praise the Lord for that. And that's the work of Jesus. But at that time, uh, Samuel was God's appointed voice. And so the Lord says to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. Saul was, was the king at that time, but he had proven to be very quickly a big disappointment. He started out humble um, and, and, uh, and depending on the Lord, and very quickly this changed in his life, and he became arrogant and much more concerned about what people thought about him than what God thought about him. And so he shows that he doesn't have a heart for God. So God says, as always, God can't, work with people who don't have a heart for him because God uses our wills. And so God says to Samuel, I've rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. We look back 
um, from our time, and to us, it's so momentous, right? It's Bethlehem. We knew that the Savior would be the Savior was born there. Jesus was born there. We know it's David, and we look back and we think this is such a big deal. But for Samuel, this was a very small deal. At that time, Bethlehem was kind of a nothing city not even a city, it was a little town. And the family of Jesse, if we look a little bit further, was not, um, it wasn't a, a, a wealthy family, it wasn't even a very well-known family at all. But God says, go there to Jesse's house, and I've chosen one of his sons. So they arrive there. Uh, it's a very dangerous job that Samuel is given. And um, next click, please. Is this not, sorry, is this not working at all? Okay. So I'm, so if this doesn't work, I'll just tell you click, okay? Oh, it's going to be a lot of clicks this morning. <laughs> okay. So when they arrived there, uh, Samuel took one look at Eliab. Eliab is son number one, and I think he must be good looking. I think probably it was a good looking family, actually. Uh, David, as we know, is actually very good looking, but Eliab is there, and there must be something about him that um, is very appealing. And so uh, Samuel took one look at Eliab, and he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Now, grab on to these verses. Grab onto these verses and hold them for yourself. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Despite Eliab's outwardly impressive credentials, God was not impressed. God is never impressed by outward things. God is never impressed by outward uh, natural abilities either. Same thing was true for Saul, who was a head and a half taller than anyone else. As we, as we saw last week in the very next chapter, though Saul was outwardly impressive, he quailed in fear before Goliath, who was that much taller. And so God, God looks at hearts. Even today, God looks at hearts. And we see some things here that tell us about God. God does not change the way he interacts with people. And so God reminds Samuel, thank you. God reminds Samuel, I'm looking at hearts. I'm looking at hearts. And Eliab's heart is not a heart that I can use. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you something this morning. Everyone around us perhaps is looking at our, at our outsides. Our employers may look at our outsides. Society may look at our outsides. God's not looking at your outside. Um, he doesn't care if you combed your hair this morning or not, or, or, or any of these things, although, you know, if we comb our hair, that's a good thing. We don't want to look like we were pulled out of a bush. Um, but God does look at our hearts. So if God is looking at your heart this morning, what does he see? What does he see? Does he see someone like David, who was a man after God's own heart? Or does he see someone like Eliab or Saul, who had great confidence in their own ability and in their outward qualities, but failed when it came to the test. And so uh, God says, nope, this is not the one. And then in the same way, all seven of the other sons are presented to Samuel, but Samuel's learned his lesson, and he says, the Lord has not chosen any of these. He's not chosen any of these. Is there one more? And Jesse, sort of, if you will, sort of scratches his head and says, oh, yeah, there's one more out in the pasture, uh, the youngest one, but he's, he's taking care of the sheep. So obviously, though as we find out, David was a nice looking young guy, uh, there was nothing particularly noticeable or notable about him at the time. Um, he was forgettable, if you will. And so uh, he is called and Samuel says, send for him at once. And when, when David appears, the Lord says, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Now this is Old Testament. So as I said last time, I'm not particularly interested in Old Testament history, except what it tells us about God and Jesus and what it speaks to us today for our lives. And so Samuel takes the olive oil and he anoints him uh, and the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. So the olive oil can be seen because it's being poured on David, isn't it? But can the Holy Spirit, can the spirit of the Lord be seen as it comes upon David? 
No, not at all. That's something invisible. That's something intangible. But it will be seen through the works of David as he walks and works in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what God does today. Don't get too focused on outward signs and outward things. Instead, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit and to anoint you with his Spirit and then do the works of God, not in your own ability, not in your own power, but in the power of the Spirit. And when we work in the power of the Spirit, God's work will always be done. It will always be done, and it will be done well. It, and it will be done right. And so this is what happens. So there's an outward symbol, but the Spirit of God also comes on David. So, great. We're getting to David and Saul. So God has chosen David. The Spirit of the Lord is on David in a powerful way. He's probably, uh, commentators believe he was somewhere between 12 and 18 years old. So let's just pick the middle number. Let's say he's about 15, okay? Um, which is pretty impressive. And there, there are reasons for saying he's about that age or, or looking at ages in that, in that general. So what happens next? He's been anointed king and the spirit of the Lord is upon him. Uh, do his brothers know? His brothers probably don't know exactly. David knows and I believe David's father knows and Samuel knows. Um, but they may think, well, he's anointed for some special task or some special service, but obviously God has chosen him. So what happens? Samuel goes on his way the three older brothers, Eliab and the other ones, go off to war with Saul, and David goes back to the sheep. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now, we're going to learn some things this morning if we haven't learned them yet. Have you ever felt God wants to use you? God has spoken to your heart. There's something burning inside, and yet you feel that what you're doing is so inconsequential you're in a by-the-way place. Nobody's noticing what you're doing. You say, but God, you've put this in my heart and your heart is burning. And you want, the, you want to do these things. You want to serve the Lord. You want to work for the Lord. And yet, there you are in the pasture with the sheep. That's where David returned, even though Samuel anointed him, even though God gave him a dream and a very specific purpose, a big one, and a God, maybe one way to, to refer to it is a God-given desire. That may be a way, a, a little more helpful for us to understand. Um, and yet, David returns to the sheep. David is with the sheep when Saul asks for somebody to come find somebody who can play music for me to ease my troubled mind. Uh, David is with the sheep when his father is looking for an errand boy and a messenger boy to go off to, ba to, go off to the three brave brothers at battle. Uh, David is with the sheep when he sets out, as Jesse had directed him, his dad had directed him, and, and with the sheep is where his big brother Eliab, who probably has something in his heart against his brother, since he wasn't chosen by Samuel, uh, when Eliab says, what are you doing here? Eliab wants to send him back to the pasture with the sheep. And he says worse things than this, really. He says, I know you're proud and arrogant, your deceitful heart. You just want to see the battle. Um, oh, we could say a lot about that, but we're not. Um, but David knows what God has called him to do. But he has been patient and faithful, just taking care of sheep. So let me say something to you right now. We're going to talk about this this morning. This is this first point. You can think of it as an extended introduction if you want to, uh, or you can think of it as the point one. We're going to talk about the dream that God gives us, the purpose that God puts in our hearts, the God-given desire or, or promise or word that he speaks to us. And what, what is that like and what does it mean in our lives? And how soon will that be realized? And David, the example of David, really gives us something to hold on to for our own lives as well. Um, so we, we look at this. David was still doing taking care of sheep. He was still being obedient in the very simple thing to which God had called him. But the word, word of God and the promise of God has not yet been worked out in his life. Is it God's word? Yes. Did David dream it up for himself? No. Is he anointed to do this work, to be called? He is. He is. And yet, he's not there yet. He's not there. 
He still has a way to go. And yet there are still obstacles to overcome in front of him until he is in the position and doing the work that God has called him to do, the place that God has called him to be and the work that God has called him to do. But for a while, things move very, very quickly. Um, go ahead and look at that because we're going to see what happens next. But uh, for a while, things start moving very quickly. He enters Saul's court part-time as a musician. He defeats Goliath. That's chapter 18. And then David and Jonathan, Saul's oldest son, become best friends, right? They become besties, if you will. He joins Saul's army and he distinguishes himself so bravely and so loyally that Saul, before he begins to get jealous, that Saul grants him a high rank in the army. Obviously, uh, David does so well that even the army officers are pleased that David, this young guy, is promoted above them. That tells you something, doesn't it, about what type of person David is. And so things are moving very quickly. And then Saul decides, oh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, give him, I'll give him one of my daughters in marriage. But at this point, this has started to happen, and things are happening in Saul's heart. And then uh, Michael, the, the daughter, that's a, a girl's name also, then um, when Saul finds out Michael, my daughter, loves David, I'm going to let them get married, but I'm going to trap David in this way. And so David is pretty innocent about it. And he thinks, oh, this is great, because I think probably David loved Michael as well, we, we assume, because this says, in the Bible it says David was very pleased when he heard that. Um, and so, although it sounds like an arranged marriage, which it was, it was probably also a love match, I think, as we, as we look at this. So by earthly standards, it looks like uh, God's plan and purpose and the God-given desire that David has in his heart is going to happen very soon, right? Look at all of these advancements. Look at what is happening. But not so fast. Not so fast. Because one day Saul hears a song that the people are singing. And the people are singing, Saul has killed his thousands of enemies and David his ten thousands. <laughs> well, for... Um, an insecure leader, that's the worst thing you could hear. And jealousy begins to grow in Saul's heart. And when he hears that, and then when he realizes God is with this young man, David has not said, Saul, ha, by the way, God has selected me. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the king now. Even though you still have the crown, I'm the king. David never says that. Samuel doesn't say that even. It's still a, a secret. It's still something that is in the heart of David. But Saul realizes. Brothers and sisters, the Bible, you look at Saul's response, but let me say something to you. The Bible has a very specific uh, 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 declaration about this. It says a man or a woman's gifts make way for them. Okay? I don't know if you've heard that expression before or not, or that, that verse from the Bible or not. When God puts things in your heart and God gives you giftings and equippings that are beyond the natural, you just do what God has called you to do. Just do what he's called you to do. Do what's in your heart to do. And as you serve the Lord in his time and in his way, these doors will open for you. That's what happens with David. David's not trying to manipulate the situation. David's not trying to gain support from all of Israel. David is just doing what's in his heart to do. The Spirit of God is upon him. He's a brave young man. He goes into battle. He defeats the enemy and that opens doors for David. And people begin to see, oh, here is this, here is this young man that has the power of God on him and he's faithful and he's loyal. You see, a, a surefire way to close the door to God's work in this particular situation would have been if David had done all of this, but then behind the scenes would have been saying, but really, don't you think I'd be a better king than Saul? Look, I'm a great warrior. And remember, Saul was afraid of Goliath, but I wasn't. Who cut off, Saul's, uh, who cut off Goliath's head? I did. I did. David never does any of that. David just does what he's called to do. David uses uh, the tools that God has given him, and he does that. So I encourage you 
Do what God has called you to do. Be what God has called you to be in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord. Don't depend on your own effort. Don't depend on your own strength. Don't try to make things happen. Just do what God has called you to do. That's what David does. But after this promising start, things begin to change. And Samuel, uh, sorry, not Samuel, Saul begins to get jealous. Um, and from this point onward, Saul fears him. He becomes the enemy of David, and from this point on, Saul begins to scheme against David. And we know the story well, so I won't go into the details. Saul tries to openly murder David, or behind the scenes have somebody else kill David. So he starts scheming. If he can't kill David, maybe the Philistines will kill David. So this begins to happen. And this is not our main point, but I want to say something this morning to each one of us, and we will get to this a little bit later as well. Saul's decline here is a perfect example, a perfect warning to you and to me why we must take care of our hearts. We must take care of our hearts. Saul's begins with some jealousy against a young man who's very successful. It ends with repeated attempts to murder this young man. Don't let something small that's not right, and you know it's not right, don't let it stay in your heart. It may be a grudge against someone. It may be an unforgiveness against someone. It may be bitterness, but a bitterness is a little bit further down the line. Bitterness isn't an immediate response, but bitterness happens when anger and unforgiveness stay in our hearts, and bitterness will always grow. Any of these things will always grow in our hearts, poison our hearts, warp our character and eventually overflow and, and poison others as well. And Saul is such a good example of this. He's such a good example. Um, God has looked at Saul's heart and he knows that this is Saul's heart. He knows this is Saul's heart. And he looks at David and he knows that David does not have this type of heart. And that's one of the reasons that God chooses David. And we'll talk a, talk a little bit more about why else God cho uh, chose David. But guard your hearts, and that's why the Bible says, guard your heart, for in it are the wellsprings of life. In it are the wellsprings of life. Now, if God guards our hearts and wants us to guard our hearts, because see, we, we're responsible for our hearts, aren't we? God's not going to come down and put angels all around your heart and say, don't worry, I'm going to keep everything bad out of your heart. No, God doesn't do that. What God does is he gives us his word, and he says, I give you my word, and you have your will to choose what you open your heart to. We're responsible for our hearts. We're responsible. And so a good example for us this morning of why we have to watch our hearts and guard our hearts. We're going to look at that just a little bit more as well. If we don't deal with it while it's still in thought form, it's going to put down roots in our hearts. And it's going to be hard to get out. Have you ever found that to be true when you've let something stay in your heart? You knew it shouldn't be there but it was in your heart and it was much harder to deal with the further it went along, right? So we get rid of it early. Uh, some of you perhaps are gardeners here. I'm not a great gardener, my sister is, but oh, I learn all sorts of things from her and when she's out in the garden, she's weeding the garden and she always gets the weeds out while they're small, while they're small. And she always makes sure she gets all of the roots from the weeds because she said if there, are any, if there are any roots left, even small, it'll come back. It will come back. Me, I'm, you know, I look out there and I think, huh, there's a weed. <laughs> or even worse, there's a weed and I get garden shears and I clip the top off. <laughs> well, that's fairly worthless. The roots are still there. Um, and so we deal with these things and if roots start developing, get the roots out. So that's an example for us from Saul. So we see this happening and then it gets worse. He's married uh, David has married Michael, and, Dave, and Saul sends people to kill uh, da David when he comes out of the house. Michael, the daughter, finds uh, the daughter of Saul and the wife of David, finds out about it. And what does he say? If you don't escape tonight, you'll be dead by morning. And he would have been dead. So she helps him to climb out through the window, and he escaped. If you read a little bit further in this chapter, and we're not going to, you'll see so much about Saul and his relationship with his daughter. Uh, because when he finds out that his daughter has helped her husband escape, he says terrible things to her. 
and he says terrible things to Jonathan later as well. Um, but what we see here is, is a good example of a good marriage, a good marriage relationship. And so David begins to run. Now, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to cover 11 chapters this morning. You ready? Those of you who know me are saying, Pastor Jennifer, that's impossible. You can't cover 11 chapters in, in the 30 minutes or so we have left. But I think we can. Because the next 11 chapters of 1 Samuel describe the life on the run that David will have for the next, oh, almost 15 years, maybe, maybe 14, 13 years, something like that, David is going to be on the run. So how are we going to get through that uh, very quickly? Briefly, with a few verses and a map. So let's see what comes next. Take a look at this, and you say, Pastor, that's a little bit too uh, blurry for me to see. Don't worry, it's not your eyes, it's the map. But the only thing I do want you to look at is look at all the green arrows everywhere. You see all the green arrows? Uh, Cindy is squinting right now, but that's because her, it's her birthday today, so she's older. So take a look. at. I remember these things. So take a look at that. So you see um, all the arrows all over the place, and you say, well, I'm trying to follow. Don't worry about following, but just take a look at, at all of the traversing that David. These, are all, uh, th these all mark all of the places that David runs all over Israel, outside of Israel in Philistine territory and even over into the Moabite territory at one time. This describes what he does for, e for um, 11 chapters and about 13 years, roughly or so. He's on the run. And this is important for us. This is going to be important for us because as we look at this, I want us to keep in mind God has given David a dream. God has given him a calling. He's the king. He's anointed to be king, but he's running for his life in the wilderness. I started counting, and in these 11 chapters, it is mentioned 18 times. David moves from here to here. How many of you feel like you've moved a lot in Hong Kong? Anybody? Okay, Sister, Sister Lisa. I counted, and, and uh, Marianne and others, maybe inside Hong Kong, outside Hong Kong, and, and just all in Hong Kong, right? I, I started counting up how many times I'd moved, and the last time I moved to where I am living now, before I moved there, my very specific prayer, deeply heartfelt, was, God, I don't want to keep moving. Give me a place where I can have a home and have peace in that home. And, and you know, if you haven't prayed that before and you feel stressed about this, ask God for that, because God gives his beloved, and you are his beloved, he, it is his desire to give you a home and a place of peace and rest. Even if you're a, a domestic helper this morning and you are living in, a, in another person's home, God can give you a home and a rest where you are. You ask God for that. And if you're in a place now where you are not at peace, ask God about it and ask God for a place of peace. I believe with all of my heart it is God's desire that his people live in peace, in security, in safety, in rest. Our homes are, we are renewed in, that, in those places. We are restored in those places. And if you don't feel that, and if you don't have that now, I urge you to ask God for it. And I urge you to do this as well. This is a aside, but I, I urge you to do this as well. In the place that is presently your home, talk to God in that home. Put your hands on the walls and say, God, I dedicate this place to you. It is yours. It is for your purpose. It is for your glory. May your peace rest upon this place. Protect me in this place. Give me peace in this place. And then if God leads you to pray or to move to another place, ask God. Ask God and, and trust him and trust him. And I'm so thankful. God, I, that is God's desire for his people. And when we pray that sincerely from our hearts, I believe God answers. He hears and he answers that prayer. Amen? I really believe that. I believe that. And that can also be related to your work as well. If you are in the position of finding a place for work, I believe that applies there as well. These are some of God's promises and desires for his people. So when, when our prayers 
meet God's promises mixed with our faith and God's love for us, these things happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. But for David, at this time, something else was going on. Eighteen times David moves. You say, you're going to read 18 times? Nope, I'm not. I'm just going to look at a few. So look with me really quickly. David escapes from Saul. This tells you how terrible it was. He goes to King Achish of Gath. Do you know who King Achish of Gath is? He's a Philistine. He's a Philistine. It's so bad with Saul that he goes and lives with the enemy. That's pretty bad, isn't it? That's pretty bad. So there's one of the places. And then another place, he goes in the strongholds of the wilderness in the hill country of Ziph. Saul keeps hunting him, but David wouldn't let, uh, God didn't let Saul find him. Go a little bit further. By this time, men have been joined to David, and they move into another wilderness. Saul starts searching for him again. He goes further into to the wilderness, and he remained there in the wilderness of Ma'an, but Saul kept after him in the wilderness. And then Saul returns. Uh, next one. And David has moved into the wilderness of En Gedi. So you see a word, right? Do you see a word that's showing up again? You should, because I've also put it in bold. And what comes next? David learned that Saul had come after, come after him in the wilderness of Ziph. So he moves at least 18 times, but also from place to place. And he moves in caves, in forests, in rocky strongholds, in deserts, in small towns among the Israelites, in enemy territory, but mostly in the wilderness. A place, of, a place where there's no, uh, they would have lived probably in tents or even sometimes out in the open. So I want us to look at this for just a minute as we come into, as we look at part two. So in the first part I talked about the dream that God gives us, the purpose that God gives us, the calling that God gives us. So just as we look at this, think again about what God has put in your heart, okay? Has God put something in your heart? How do you know it's from God? Because um, we're going to look at David going into the wilderness. If it, if it helps people, if it's something good, it's usually from God. If it is, oh God, I want to be super rich, it's probably not from God. <laughs> God, I want the largest co company in the world. It's probably not from God. Is there anything wrong with the largest company in the world? Not a thing. Is there anything wrong with being super rich? Not a thing. But God puts dreams in our hearts that are for the good of people, right? God cares about people. That's who God cares about. He cares about you individually, and He cares about people as a whole. So when God begins to put these things in your heart and desires in your heart, if it is only something self-serving, me, 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 it's usually not God. <laughs> okay? That's an easy way to look at it. See, if we looked at David and say, well, he wants to be king. No, that's not it. If you look carefully at what it says, God says, I am choosing someone to lead my people. David was going to be king because God cared about his people. He wanted them shepherded. He wanted them led. He wanted them to follow a righteous king. So God cared about people. So brothers and sisters, when God begins to put things in your heart and dreams in your heart, it will always be for your good. God will never harm you to help others. You got that? Let me say it one more time. God will never harm you to help others. But God will do good to you. God, God will do what is good in you. But God also wants to do what is good through you through you. And this is what we see in God's dreams this, th that he gives us, these God-given desires, these God-given things. And so we have this. And so David had this as he goes into the wilderness and we wonder, okay, why then, why isn't David made king right away? Now, why do I ask this question? Because some of you this morning, or if you are a parent of youth especially, or even children, your children or your youth may have a desire or a dream. I want to do this. I think God is calling me to do this, but it's not happening yet. Or you're hoping for things, and it's not happening yet. What we see about David can help us this morning. So, here is David. He has a God-given purpose. He has a good desire. It's a good goal, but he's in the wilderness, and he's waiting. Now, you may say, well, he's not waiting. He's running. But what I want to say to you this morning is I believe he's waiting. He's waiting on God. God's doing something in this. We say, well, he's just running. Isn't running wasted time? There's much more than running going on 
in these many years as David goes from place to place in the wilderness. God's purpose for David and in David cannot be accomplished in the throne room with the crown on his head. God's purpose has to be worked out in the wilderness. Some of you this morning have something from God in your heart and you're thinking, God, why hasn't it happened yet? This is a good thing. I believe, God, you've put it in my heart. Why isn't it being worked out? Learn to trust God, that he's doing something in your life and in your heart. You're not there yet, but it's not wasted time. It's not wasted time. God is doing something. God is doing something. Now, what is God doing? God's working in the wilderness. And so what we see as we look at point two is this. God is at work as we wait in the wilderness. So actually that's the main point two. But what is God doing in the life of David? David is learning how to be a leader in the wilderness. Some of you this morning are saying, God hasn't called me to be a leader. That's fine. God hasn't called you to be a leader. But I know God has put something in your life. You see, God's people are called to do good works. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Because God says so. He has created good works in advance for you to do and for me to do. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. You read that in other places as well. So God has put things in your heart that he wants you to do. There are things yet ahead that God wants you to do. You don't even know what those things are yet. God does. But how's he going to get you to that? How's he going to, how are you going to be ready to do these things? How are you going to be ready fu to fulfill the work, the purposes that God has put in your heart? God's going to have to do some work in you. And if you're not yet at the place that you believe God has for you, then you're in the wilderness just as David is in the wilderness. You may be in Hong Kong this morning. You may be whatever. But God has you in the wilderness. Do some of you feel that way this morning? Can you feel like you've been in the plate? You're running. Things are going on. This is for you then this morning. This is for you. Don't despair. God is at work. Don't give up what God has put in your heart. That is God's word to you. That is God's promise to you. That is a God-given desire in your heart. Let God keep working in the wilderness. So as we look at David, David has to learn to be a leader. So for some of you, it might be something else because God may have not called you to do this. But this is what David had to learn. David, when he is anointed king, is how old? About how old? Fifteen. How many of you think a 15-year-old, apologies to any of you who have a 15-year-old son or daughter this morning, I apologize, but honestly, how many of you believe a 15-year-old is ready to lead a nation? Anybody? Nobody. Nobody thinks that. So God has called him. It's real. It's a, it's a purpose from God. But David is not yet ready to lead. And God can't do that in the throne room. God has to teach David to be a leader in the wilderness. That's where he's going to learn. Now, has David already started learning? Yes. Do you know where David started learning? He started learning in the pasture. A shepherd is a leader. A shepherd has to take care of the sheep. A shepherd has to provide for the sheep and take them to good pasture and make sure they get water and protect them against the lions and the bears that come. That's level one. That's kindergarten level of learning to be a leader. But what God has for David is bigger than that. So you start there and then you keep on going. That's why, brothers and sisters, we must not despise the basic and simple things that God calls us to do. That's why we must not despise the things that we think, somebody else left, less gifted could do this. This is why God calls us to do it, because it's a process, and he's taking us on. And so, David has a heart for God, but his character must be developed. He must be tested. He must be proven. David has to learn to be a good leader. When David first starts running, who's he thinking of? Himself. Saul wants to kill him. Now, before we judge David, if somebody wanted to kill you, what would you do? <laughs> Thank you. I'd run too. 
I'd run, I'd hide, I'd change my name, I'd move to another country. Um, and here's a great example. Saul doesn't give up even when he, you know, even when he's going here and there, whatever. We would all have the same response that David has. Protect your own life. Save your own skin. But if he's going to be the leader and the king of Israel, he's going to have to learn to think of more than himself, right? He's got to think of more than himself. Same thing with what God is doing in you. And so what happens next? So David left Gath. I love this verse. I love this passage. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before. Here we see David beginning to learn to lead people. He left Gath, Philistines, took refuge in the cave of Adullam. He's living in a cave. I don't know about you, but I don't like caves. There are bats in caves. And maybe the coronavirus came from bats. We, we don't know. But um, bad things happen in caves, it seems like. But David moves into a cave. It must, be a, it must be a big cave. When his brothers and his father's whole family heard, they went down and they joined him there. In addition, all of those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. Ding, 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 right? He became their leader. About 400 men were with him. And very soon, that means also there were families with him, okay? So later on, more join. And later on, it will be mighty men and great warriors. Wives and families come along as well. But look first at who David is going to lead. Have you noticed the irony of this before? There are three D words here. A lot of Bibles uh, translated exactly this, this, way, this way. All of those... He's going to be their leader who were what? In distress or in debt or, oh, I'm sorry, discontented. Change that word. Now you know one of, at least one of your pastors is not perfect in case you didn't know that before, but I think you knew that. Okay, sorry, not discounted, but that would be another good word, discontented. Okay, discontented. So what I want you to think about for a minute is this. Look at those three types of people. Listen. It is easy to lead perfect people. Yeah? Are these perfect people? No way. Some of these people are jerks. Okay? There are people who have a grudge. There are people who have a problem. There are people who uh, have messed up lives, if you will, if you want to look at it this way. And I, when, I, when I was reading this and thinking about this, I just laughed when I got to this verse. God is teaching David how to be a real leader. Because you know what? People aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. And David, if he's going to be king over all Israel, he can't just be king over the good people. He can't just be king over the perfect people. He's going to have to be king over all the people. And so he goes into a hard school right now. Here he is on the run from Saul and the people who are, uh, who are in debt or who are discontented or who, who are in distress. They all, he has to lead such people. It would not have been easy, I think. It would not have been. Do you wonder sometimes why God is taking you through some hard things with people, sometimes in relationships? He's working things and you just think, oh, oh God. And there's fuss. Is it possible that God is working on something in you because he has something else for you as well? I think it's possible. I think it's possible. And so David has to learn to lead people who aren't perfect. David has to learn to lead a difficult group. Amen. So here's the first thing. So David learns to be a leader. And the application for you and for me is the things that God has for you, his purpose, his plan, God is going to take you into the wilderness and you are going to have to learn those things in the wilderness that you need to fulfill the God-given desire in your house. You've got to learn it. And I, I urge you, this, this may not be as inspirational as last week, but I promise you this is truth and it's something that we have to go through. It's not easy and it's not pleasant, but we have to go through it if God is going to fulfill purposes in our lives, if these God-given desires in your life are going to be fulfilled. It will never be a gift from God. It will never be a gift. It will be something that God works through in our lives. And so first, 
um, that first lesson in the wilderness, he learns the skills he needs to be what God has called him to be. So he learns to be a leader. The next thing we see is that David learns to let things go. Uh, I was careful about phrasing this because I didn't want everybody to immediately start thinking of Frozen and Elsa again and let it go. Um, <laughs> So I, 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 I was carefully rephrasing it. That's not particularly eloquent, but I put it that way, that way anyhow, okay? So I just said, let things go. And you say, well, pastor, you used to be an English teacher. Can't you choose a better word than things? Sure, I could, but I, I kept it more general, and I just said things, and this is why. David has to learn to let things go because God puts this God-given it, God gives us this desire in our hearts. God has put a dream there, and it's in your heart. But if you and I let things stay in our hearts that are not from God, what is not of God will crowd out and poison what is of God in your life. That's why I said that in the beginning about Saul needing to guard his heart. David had to learn to let things go. Why do I say that? And this is a, le I don't have to give you a general application here. This is a specific one for each one of us. Relationships with people, I don't know any other way to say it, brothers and sisters. Relationships with people are messy. They're messy. That's just the way it is. We're all messy. You say, well, you're not whatever. No, I'm not. We're all messy. We really are. We've all got parts that aren't perfect. We've all got things. And we've got to give one another grace. I mean it. And that's something that we're all working on. We're all working on. And what I see in the life of David that God is drilling into him as he's in the wilderness is this, is this truth. David has to let things go from his heart. And it's not easy. And I'm, I promise you I am not preaching down to you um, from the top of the mountain so that you think I've arrived and I've got this all under control. It's something I'm still working on in myself. I want to give you some examples. And in, and in case you have a question about this one, you say, are you sure, Pastor Jennifer, that's one of the lessons in the wilderness, waiting in the wilderness? I promise you it is because this happens about five different times with David in the wilderness. So this is in Sam, 1 Samuel 23, and you're going to be, there are going to be a whole bunch of verses there, but don't worry about it. Just look at it as we kind of go through quickly. So David is wandering in the wilderness, and then he hears that the Philistines are at Keilah. That's how you pronounce it. I didn't know till I looked it up. Now you know, and now I know. Um, and they are they're, uh, looting grain, and they're fighting the Israelites. Now remember God has called David to be king of his people and one of the things that a king does is he protects his people. So even though he's not sitting on a throne, David says, God, should I go? And God says, yes, go. Look at what God says. Yes, go and save Keilah. So David goes, he saves them, he protects them, and then in the meantime, Saul learns that David is there. And Keilah was a very strong city with walls and a big strong gate. And apparently David not only saves the people of Keilah, he and his men moved there for a while. How nice. They've been living in a cave. They've been living in the wilderness. Now they can live in a city for a while. And not only that, they can live in a very grateful city or town because David and his men have saved Keilah from the Philistines. Yay! A home for a while. And then David keeps on praying. Saul, in the meantime, is marching with his army. And then what do we see next? David prayed. And he says, oh God, I've heard that Saul is coming, is planning to come and destroy Keilah because I'm here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me to him? What? What? David and his men ha have not even being asked, they have gone and they have saved the whole city. They have defeated the enemy. They have preserved them. They've done good to them. And David says, are they going to betray me? And God said, and, and is Saul coming? Please tell me. And the Lord says he will come. Now, by the way, that's not really what David wants to know. What David wants to know is, but are they going to betray me? So what happens next? And David asked again, will the leaders of Keilah betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, <laughs> I love this. Yes, they will betray you. <laughs> okay, so here's David with his army and his men. What would we be tempted to do at this point? Okay, well, he's going to run. If you haven't read it, he's, he's going to run, right? What would you say? Right. 
Thank you, Keith. Keith and I have the same heart. So sorry. It's wicked and hard, right? Keith said, I'd be tempted to destroy the city. Surely most people would have that thought, right? We just risked our necks for you, and you're going to betray us to Saul? What does David do instead? So David and his men, now about 600 of them, and their families left Keilah and began roaming the countryside. What a step down from what was. But there's no vengeance against the city. He does nothing against them. Now, in case you think I'm cherry picking and just picking out one little thing, if you read your Bibles, the very next chapter, guess what? Something like this, almost exactly like this, happens again. The elders of Ziph go to Saul and they say, hey, 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 David's here. We'll betray him to you. Come, we'll tell you where he is. And again, David just runs. He doesn't take vengeance. He doesn't hold it in her heart. He just lets it go, and he keeps on going. You see, brothers and sisters, the people that we feel have wronged us, the people that we feel have hurt us, the people that we feel have done what they shouldn't do when we tried to treat them fairly or when we tried to treat them right, we're all in the same family together most of the time. Now, sometimes with non-Christians and others that are not part of the church, you, you go through another process, but Jesus loves them too. And Jesus wants to reach them too. And what we see with David here, and also with Saul, is that David doesn't hold it in his heart. And that really speaks to me. I hope it speaks to you. You know this, uh, this passage. This is with Saul. Saul is chasing David for his life. You can see that's in chapter 24. And because he's king, especially, um, he goes into the cave for privacy to go to the bathroom. And he doesn't know that David and all his men are far back in the cave. And so his men say, go up there, kill him. And David says, no, I'm not going to kill him. But he does go up and he cuts off part of the robe. Um, and then when we look at that, look at what David says to Saul. We won't read the whole thing because our time is, is coming short. He says, look, my father, at what I have. In my he says, I will never harm the king. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. I, this proves I'm not trying to harm you and that I've not sinned against you even though you've been hunting for me to kill me. And we see this example not only here but again as well. And he says, may the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. And I thought about that in this whole thing about letting things go. Because if anybody surely would have been justified to take revenge... David would have, right? Saul had tried to kill him. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in my heart, I want to be justified. Well, I'm right, they're wrong, and things like that. And when I get into that, and when you get into that, it does no good thing in our hearts. It does no good thing in our hearts. Let God sort it out. Let God deal with it. Let God make it right. But for you and for me, let it go. L really, let, the, let things go. Why do you have to let things go? You have to let things go because there's not enough room in your heart or my heart for what God has put there and for all of these other things we're holding on to. You've got to let it go, brothers and sisters. Let, just say, God, get this out of my heart. I don't want it there. I want your dream for me. I want your God-given purpose. I want you to fill my heart and when we ask that of God, He will help us. He will help us get these other things out of our hearts and out of our lives. And then what is there will be good. It won't, it, God's purposes won't be stunted in your heart, but He'll be able to fully do what He plans to do. If David had held on to revenge and bitterness, he could never have been the king that God called him to be, right? But instead, God went to the, uh, David went to the throne without a string of enemies thinking, now that I'm king, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to cut your ears off, and I'm going to do that. He didn't do that. And, and we say, but hey, that's what kings did in those times. They took revenge on all the enemies. David went to the throne with a gentle heart because you see those who had been his enemies he was going to rule over as well so you got to let these things go brothers and sisters let them go this is one of the lessons of waiting in the wilderness
And then finally, I'm, I'm skip, am I skipping over? I sure am. I'm skipping over. Here's the final lesson. God, uh, David learns to let God fulfill his promise. He lets God do it. And how does this fit? This is one of the, this is the most important part um, of the lesson in the wilderness. He lets God fulfill his word. What does that mean for you and for me as we look in closing this morning? God has put something in your heart, and you and I as people, sometimes we want to make it happen, don't we? We want to try to manipulate. If things are moving too slow, what can I do to hurry along? If we think, come on, God, it could, it could be whatever, we start trying to influence people to make things happen. David never, never does that. At one point, remember in the cave, David's men whispered to him, now's your opportunity. Now's the time when he was in the cave. And what do the men say? Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy in your power. In other words, kill him. Kill him now. Because once Saul is dead, hey, David, the path is clear. You can be king. But what about all the people that were still loyal to Saul? They were of the tribe of Benjamin. David had to lead those people too. And David is unwilling to manipulate people or circumstances to make this thing happen. And I think this is a hard, a difficult lesson for you and for me. But David refuses to do it. And David doesn't kill Saul himself, and he doesn't let his men kill them either. It happens again a few chapters later. Look what Abishai says. Abishai is his nephew. He's his nephew. And Abishai is with him as Saul is sleeping. And Abishai, it sounds like God, doesn't it? What does he say? God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time. He has another chance to kill Saul. But David does not do it. He does not do it. David refuses to take into his hands the power that God is one day going to give him. He leaves it in God's hands. He leaves it in God's hands. And so when the time comes, here we go, are you ready? When the time comes, almost 15 years later, when David becomes king, here's the conclusion. You ready? Then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. God wants to know if that dream in your heart, if that desire in your heart, is it God's or is it yours? Are you going to let God fulfill it? Or are you going to grab it and say, well, I'm going to do this. Look what I've done. Or are you going to hold it loosely like David is, like David did? And when David stepped into the throne, David knew, God, you did this. You did this. Brothers and sisters, that's what God wants for each one of us. As he does these things in our lives, do we let him do it? Or are we pushing and manipulating to try to make things happen? If we will let God lead us, and make this happen and fulfill the dream as we are faithful, waiting in the wilderness, not wasted time, learning what God wants us to learn. When we get to the point and the place where this dream is fulfilled, you and I will know, as David knew, Lord, you established me. Yeah? Lord, you did it. I didn't do it myself. I'm not a self-made man or a self-made woman. Lord, you made me. You brought me to this position. And it's not just for me. Who is it for? The sake of his people. That brings us back to where we started, right? The dream that God has. So David reigned over all Israel, and he did what was just and right for, what's that word? What comes after for? For all his people. You mean the difficult, the discontented, those in debt and those in distress? Did he do what was right for all of them? What about his enemies in Keilah who were going to betray him? Did he do what was right and just for all of them? He did. What about from the tribe of Benjamin? That was Saul's tribe. He was king. Did he do right for them? He did. What about Saul's descendants who would have had a claim to the throne? David did right by them. Brothers and sisters, when we let God establish us, 
He will fulfill his purposes for our own good. God always wants to do good to you. And God always wants to, good, to do good, what is good, through you. This is God's purpose. This is what God puts in our hearts. We're going to close in prayer this morning. And I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll, we'll dismiss you. But look at, think about these, th these things and just ask yourself, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? this morning? What, what has he spoken to you? Some parts will be more meaningful to you than others, but you know what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. It is not what Pastor Jennifer is saying to you. It's what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. For me, I've prayed through and I'm still praying through these things myself. But what does God say to you this morning? As we look at the life of David and Saul, waiting in the wilderness, waiting for that time when God's word would be fulfilled in his life. And it was, but it was fulfilled in the right way and in the right time. And, Dave, and, it, and that was possible because David had the right heart. So Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you that you put someone like David, you recorded his life in your word for us. And God, we know one day we'll meet him in heaven. But Lord, until that time, we're here, and God, we're going through some of the same things. And Lord, I pray that you would deal with our hearts that we would understand and value the God-given desire that you have put in our heart, whatever that is, big or small. Lord, most of us, perhaps none of us, have you called to be king over your people. But Lord, you have put something in our hearts. You have called us to things. And God, we ask, and God, I ask for us today that you would help us if we are running in the wilderness right now, if we're waiting in the wilderness, that we would learn the lessons that you have for each one of us as we go through this. And when the time comes that we would know you have established us and we will do what is right because you have established us and because we have learned the lessons waiting in the wilderness. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone.